Hi, everybody. This is God's side for the sad truth. There are two leading epistemologies when it comes to access to knowledge. There is, of course, science, the scientific method. Uh, and then we also have religion, which also makes pronouncements about uh, the world. When it comes to whether these two epistemologies can coexist, there are all sorts of opinions ranging from absolutely not. As you might imagine, many scientists argue that uh, you can't reconcile these two uh, epistemologies. Uh, one offers you a set of rules by which you can test hypotheses and then inch your way towards uh, some truth with humility and tentative uh, incremental knowledge. While, of course, religion makes very dogmatic pronouncements uh, by authority. And so from that perspective, these two frameworks seem to be irreconcilable. Now, other scientists are somewhat more conciliatory and diplomatic. So for example, the late um, paleontologist, Harvard paleontologist, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, proposed the NOMA principle, which stands for non-overlapping magisteria. The idea being that uh, science and religion operate in different realms and different uh, magisteria and different uh, spheres so each can contribute to the human experience and human knowledge. Uh, be that as it may, uh, we could then take that discussion of science versus religion and apply it to a very particular subset of uh, science in general, namely evolution versus religion. Uh, and here, of course, the debate uh, has been going on for many years. So, for example, when we have the discussion of should we teach creationism in uh, biology classes, which now has been repackaged as uh, should we teach intelligent design in biology classes. And so all that is part of the schism between what evolution uh, teaches us and what religion teaches us, for example, about the, uh, the genesis of our world, uh, how species come to be and so on. Uh, in any case, this idea of how do we reconcile evolution and uh, religion, if you like, is addressed by a group of evolutionary scientists who actually study religion from an evolutionary perspective. So rather than trying to pit uh, the two uh, bodies of knowledge against one another, Evolutionary scientists who study religion ask, you know, what are some evolutionary explanations that might help us understand why religion is such a uh, important part of uh, the human condition? And here we've got different uh, uh, frameworks, if you'd like, or different uh, possibilities of how to go about tackling the evolutionary roots of religion. So one group of folks argues that religion is an adaptation. In other words, religion confers survival advantage uh, to, say, religious groups. So you, this is typically coming from a what's called a group selectionist argument, namely the idea that religious groups uh, will out-survive non-religious groups because of issues such as greater communality, greater cooperation, greater cohesion. And so David Sloan Wilson, in his book, uh, Darwin's Cathedral in 2002, uh, spoke to these types of issues. Richard Sosis, uh, an uh, anthropologist, has proposed a costly signaling theory of religion, where basically he argues that you know, certain uh, religious rituals are hard to fake. In other words, they're costly signals. And by implementing and adhering to these costly religious uh, rituals, this builds greater group uh, intra-cooperation. So one type of evolutionary arguments is that religion has some adaptive value. A second camp argues that no, uh, religion is actually an exaptation or a byproduct of evolution. In other words, it's not so much that religion itself confers an adaptive value, but rather it piggybacks on other cognitive systems that evolve for other purposes. And so the a strong proponent of that view 
is the evolutionary anthropologist uh, Pascal Boyer. Uh, he wrote a book uh, back in 2001, I think it's called Religion Explained, where he proposed uh, several uh, exaptation mechanisms that religion uh, piggybacks on. So for example, uh, here's one, uh, the idea that uh, we have this uh, coalitional psychology of us versus them uh, that's a innate psychology. Uh, of course, religion is quite adept at uh, using this coalitional psychology in its service, right? So, for example, if we look at the Abrahamic uh, religions, uh, they all are strong proponents of an us versus them mindset. So, uh, mechanism one or argument one, religion is an adaptation. Argument two, religion is an exaptation. Uh, we also have uh, Richard Dawkins' idea, and here we're talking about memes. So a meme is the cultural analog of a gene. Uh, a meme could be anything that could be passed on from one brain to another. It could be an idea, a belief, a, a, you know, an advertising jingle. Uh, if you read my books, I'm infecting your brain with my memes, right? And so humans are both a biological and cultural animal. And so Richard Dawkins was trying to demonstrate how uh, ideas propagate uh, in, a, in a mechanism uh, that is ultimately Darwinian. Now, memeplexes, so a memeplex is a collection of memes. And so religion, viewed from that perspective, could be construed as a memeplex. It's a, it's a collection of ideas, typically that are codified in some holy book, which are then uh, reliably copied from one brain to another. Now, of course, one can then argue, why is it that some religious memeplex are more infectious than others. So for example, we've got 1.6 billion Muslims, whereas we've got somewhere between 13 and 16 million Jews. So the Islam memeplex is certainly a lot more, quote, viral than the Judaism memeplex. And so I'll probably in a future clip, I'll talk about that uh, specific issue. But so a third way by which we could study religion is to uh, look at religions as collections of these memeplexes. Uh, and then a fourth way we could study religion is uh, something that I call fossils of the human mind. So I argue in several of my books that cultural products uh, could be studied as fossils of the human mind, right? Human brains don't fossilize, right? Human brains are organic, but what does fossilize are the cultural products that are left behind. And so we could do a content analysis on say, Greek tragedies written thousands of years ago uh, to see that there are certain universal themes uh, that are as relevant today as they were when they were written by uh, Greek poets 3,000 years ago. Uh, song lyrics of today are very similar in their content to uh, song lyrics that were written by troubadours uh, many centuries ago. And so uh, we could do a content analysis of products uh, that speak to certain evolutionary realities. Now, how do we apply this to religion? So, Laura Betzik, a Darwinian historian, several years ago uh, published a paper where she did a content analysis of the Old Testament to demonstrate the correlation between the status of male characters in the Old Testament and how much access they had, how much sexual access they had to uh, women. So as you might expect from a Darwinian perspective, the higher the status of a male, the more sexual access to women he has. And so a, uh, a king uh, will have more uh, women uh, in terms of sexual access than some other lower ranking male. And so she did an analysis uh, of the Old Testament and validated that uh, Darwinian reality. So here we have at least four ways by which we can apply the tools of evolutionary thinking uh, to religion. So rather than arguing whether uh, evolution and religion can quote coexist, rather here we're applying evolutionary principles to actually 
understand religion. So again, to summarize, we've got religion as an adaptation, religion as an exaptation, we have religion as uh, memoplexes, and then we've got religion as products, cultural products that are fossils of the human mind. So there you have it. There is a way to study uh, even religion from an evolutionary perspective. Have a great week. Tomorrow I start my first uh, lecture of a new course, Understanding Our Consuming Instinct. Look forward to meeting the new batch of students. Talk to you soon. Ciao.